Yeah, so this is from Matthew 7, verse 13. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. In verse 24, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Oh, good, good verses. Rupert, can I pray for you? Please do. Please do. <coughs> God, we thank you for the gift of your word that uh, we can live with every day in our own homes. Thank you for Rupert, his wisdom and his, um, the work he's put into what he's going to share this morning. Just pray your blessing on him, that you would speak through him to our hearts. Help us to receive you through him this morning. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Um, I just want to promote a book <coughs> uh, by a chap called Robert Mulholland called Invitation to a Journey. This morning I want to invite us to a journey. Maybe it's a journey that we're already on, but I want to map out a little bit of that journey. This morning he maps out a journey. It's a roadmap for spiritual formation. Um, and I haven't read it all, but it's absolutely um, excellent. And I will be referring to one or two things that he talks about uh, in that book. If you've heard of an author called Ruth Haley Barton, uh, she does an awful lot on spiritual practices and spiritual formation. Uh, he is a kind of mentor of Ruth Haley Barton. I think he's died now. Um, Invitation to a Journey. We are looking in this little mini-series, I did one right at the beginning of September, and I'm now doing three, so I did last week, to this week, and next week. I don't often say this, partly because I think it's really embarrassing to watch me, but, or to listen to me. I, I, one of the painful things of COVID is seeing <clears throat> myself on camera, it's like, oh! But um, could I really encourage you, if you're part of the family here, please listen to these, because I think what I'm sharing here is a compass for us as a community about where we're going. I think it's some really foundational, key, important things uh, about our future. And uh, so please uh, do listen to the ones that you have missed and do, if you can, be here uh, next week. Um, I'm not going to recap what I've done, but we're looking at fruitfulness. And one of the things that has really struck me is that the New Testament says nothing about success. And yet in the church world, we're often consumed by success and numbers. And I think there's an invitation to step off a treadmill for success, which is an illusion that we will never reach. And the New Testament word is a word, fruitfulness. We're called to fruitfulness. Fruitfulness emerges from being healthy. Healthy tree produces fruit, was the first sermon back at the beginning of September. And then uh, last week, we looked at uh, coming away with Jesus, but in community, 
a community that comes away to be with Jesus, to be restored or rest, not you kick your shoes off and watch Netflix for hours on end. That's valuable, uh, but it's not the rest that I think the New Testament or the Scriptures talk about. It's a place of replenishment, of <sighs> breathing again. Uh, and so we were looking at being a Christ-centered community that withdraws to be with Jesus. And we're looking at three, if you like, compass points for us as a community that will help us to be fruitful together, but I also believe it will help us to be fruitful as individuals. It's our reason for being. It's the reason that we exist as a church. It's our mission, if you like. This is what we are all about. Everything that we do is because this is what we want to see, a Christ-centered community. That was last week. To see people fully alive, that is going to be this week. And then next week, to help the world flourish. And so this week, we're going to be thinking about being fully alive. I don't know if you uh, got into Strictly this year. Um, I, unfortunately, have got into Strictly because of my daughter, uh, who's probably disappeared just now. She loves Strictly, so it's become Saturday night viewing. Halfway through Strictly last night, somebody said, I'm living my best life. I don't know if you've ever had that experience where externally you maybe think things are going really well, but internally there's a deep longing and an ache for something more. To this morning, what I want to try and describe is what that something more is. It's a journey that I think we're all invited on as human beings to be fully alive. And I want to look at this scripture, particularly around the narrow and the broad road, and I want to offer an interpretation which you may not have come across. And if you consult many comment commentators, they will give you a different interpretation, but not all of them. I want to offer you something that I have thought for many years found incredibly helpful as I think about the journey of life and faith that I am on. So we're going to think about how can we be fully alive? How can we really truly live our best life? And I want to give a caveat because in 20 minutes I can't really say everything. So my caveat is there are lots of things that we can do that will help us to be fully alive. Over the last few years, I've changed some of my eating habits, some of my sleep habits, some of my caffeine habits, and it's made an enormous difference, health and fitness. All these kinds of things, small changes can make a massive difference because we're physical human beings experiencing our life and God in our bodies. And there are lots of people, there are lots of books. One of the books that's helped me is by a doctor that you'll see on the BBC. He's not a Christian, I think he might be a Buddhist. But some of his practices have been hugely helpful about how I can find more life. And so there's a whole realm of things that we could be talking about, about how to help people be fully alive or to see people fully alive. And these things are all important. I would suggest that they're not enough on their own, but they are all important things that we can do. Today, I want to think about the unique place that following Jesus has in us walking into the life that he has got for us, having our lives shaped around the teachings of Jesus and the life of Jesus, the way of Jesus. Sometimes we call this discipleship. Sometimes some people call it apprenticeship to Jesus. Some people call it spiritual formation. But it's about having our lives shaped around Jesus because that is the invitation to life. So we come to this scripture in Matthew's gospel, the scripture about the broad road and the narrow road leading to a broad gate or a narrow gate. Now, if you look at many commentators on this passage, they will talk about this as being a, a doorway into salvation. It's about you need to believe in Jesus and enter into the small gate. 
And that's how you get life. If you don't believe in Jesus, you're entering through the, broad, the big gate, and that's how you get destruction. I want to suggest a different way of reading this scripture. It's not about the future. It's not about eternal life. It's about the life that we live now, here, in this world, in this place, that there is an invitation to walk down a narrow path that leads to life or a broad path that leads to destruction. So, how do, we, how do I come to that conclusion? So, I want to, walk, I want to talk about the word sin. <gasps> <gasps> He's mentioned the S word. So it's not a word that we particularly like talking about because when we think about the word sin, we often think about somebody with a sandwich board standing down on Princess Street or some other place and they are telling us all about how you are a sinner and you must turn or burn. It's not a word that we particularly find very comfortable. It's a word that has often been associated with morality, that you are wrong and sometime, somehow you need to get your life right. There is an element of finger wagging and judgment and none of us like that, right? Now, I do want to say that I think there's maybe some elements of morality that might be helpful in that word sin, but I want to try and define sin slightly differently to think about it as a disease. I'm gonna say more about this in a few weeks time Time does not um, allow me to say much more, but think about it as a disease that gradually eats away life. It gradually takes life from us. And the other S word that I want to mention here, these are two Bible words in the Christian tradition, you'll see them all over the scriptures. The other S word is the word salvation. Now, salvation in the New Testament is sometimes seen as something that has happened to us. You have been saved. There is a rescue that has come from us when we are far away from God, that God brings us closer to Him, that we have been brought near to God, that we can be friends with Him. It is the gift of salvation that comes to us, that Jesus has, through the death and resurrection, destroyed the power of evil and sin, that we can be brought close to God. That is an amazing gift of salvation. It is how we have been saved. That is absolutely true. Please hear me. I'm not denying that at all today. That's not what I want to talk about. There is also these very uncomfortable verses that we sometimes read in the New Testament, if that is your only view of salvation, where it says that you are being saved. How's that? Surely it's something that has happened to us. That's what we have so often been taught as Christians. But the scriptures say you are being saved. We are working out our salvation. So here's the thing. When we have been far away from God and we have been brought close to God, unfortunately that doesn't stop the destructive attitudes and behaviors, what we might call sin, the disease of sin that takes life away from us as we live out of that. So there is a process by which God brings about change in our lives where the destructive behaviors, the disease and attitudes, behaviors and attitudes are removed. We are rescued. That's what the word saved means. We are rescued from the destruction that sin brings as we go on this journey of transformation. So we come to this scripture. Here's how I have come to understand this scripture that Jesus is saying. This, this scripture comes right at the end of three chapters, which is called the Sermon on the Mount. It's a collection of Jesus' sayings that in Matthew's gospel was on, the, on, on a mountain, hence Sermon on the Mount. If you've been in a swimming pool, it would have been Sermon in the Swimming Pool. But it was Sermon on the Mount because he was on a mountain. Collection of his sayings about how we are to live the best life. In light of the kingdom, in light of heaven that has come to earth, in light of the presence of God that invades and comes to us, this is how we are to live. 
the best possible life. It's incredibly challenging teaching, but Jesus seems to be saying that this is the best life. This is the heaven life, if you like. This is the God life. This is the way that you've been designed to live. And he teaches all the way through. We read it in Matthew chapter 5 and Matthew chapter 6 and the beginning of Matthew chapter 7. And then at the end, or in the middle of Matthew chapter 7, starting with these verses about the broad and the narrow roads, he starts saying the, the whole thrust of the end of chapter 7 is, is the importance of putting into practice what he has taught. Don't just listen to these words, do something about it. This is the way to live. So I think when it comes to the narrow road, we are to learn how to follow him, to live his teaching, to put it into practice. And that is how we walk along the narrow path, the way of Jesus. It shapes our lives, which is why I love this question about how does, is there a verse from Scripture that's shaping our lives just now? We're meant to put it into practice. As we walk along this path, the Scripture says it will be a path of life. We experience life as we do that. At the end of this path, there is this gate that we can enter into. This is the pathway where we are rescued from the disease, the destructiveness of sin. The word path in this chapter, in Matthew chapter 7, could be translated journey or way. The early Christians you read about in the book of Acts, which is the story of the first church when Jesus had died, resurrected, ascended to heaven. We, we read about the story of the early church, the early Christians. In the book of Acts, they're called people of the way. Same word. This narrow path is when we are apprenticed to Jesus. We follow him, we put into practice his words, we emulate our lives, we model our lives on his life. It brings life to us because we're people of the way. The other path, the broad road, the wide gate, is the one where we don't follow the practice the teachings of Jesus. We don't shape our lives around him and it leads to destruction. It's a disease that in our tradition, the Christian tradition calls sin, that slowly saps life from us. The second scripture that we read, the story of two people who build a house, one who builds a house on rock, the other one that builds a house on sand. The winds come, the rains come, the streams rise, and one house falls down and the other house survives. The only difference between the two people, they both hear the words of Jesus. But the one who builds on the rock is the one who hears the words of Jesus and puts it into practice, actually does it. <gasps> oh my word. You know, the rains come, the winds blow in our lives. We can't stop the rains raining and the winds blowing. It's all the stuff that happens around about us. It's living through a global pandemic. It's seeing people that we love grow old or get ill or die. It's losing our job. It's having relationship issues. It's the anxiety of moving to a new city to study. It's whatever else it might be. We can't stop the winds and the rain. It just is. It's life. 
the ups and downs, the joys, the sorrows, the beauty, and the pain of life that we live through. The only difference between the two people is one person hears the words of Jesus. They both hear the words of Jesus, but one hears them and puts it into practice. Gosh, how many times… I've been so convicted by this passage this summer. How many times have I heard the words of Jesus and not done anything about it? I am the foolish man. I I don't like to think of myself as foolish, but I am the foolish man who has heard the words of Jesus and done nothing about it. No wonder when the winds come and the rains come that part of my house starts falling down. No wonder. Robert Mulholland in his book defines spiritual formation, defines this journey of discipleship or being apprenticed to Jesus in this way. The process of being formed in the image of Christ for the sake of others. The process of being formed in the image of Christ for the sake of others. We'll come to the for sake of others next week. There is so much that we could say on all of this. But what I want us to notice from the two passages that we've read in Matthew chapter 7, the broad, the narrow road, and the wise and foolish man or person who's built their house, is that there is a choice. There is a choice that we have about how we shape our lives or how our lives are shaped. If you aren't doing one, you are doing the other one. If you're not walking down the narrow road, you are walking down the broad road. We are all, says Robert Mulholland, being formed or shaped by something. It's absolutely inevitable. The only question is, what are we being formed by, and what image is it shaping us into? Every thought, every action, every deed, every response, every reaction, little by little they shape us into our future selves. That, that scares me rigid, actually, if I'm honest. Every thought, deed, action, reaction, everything shapes me into something. The only question is what? Little by little, we're either shaped into Christ, into the image of Jesus, or we're shaped into the destructiveness of our brokenness and darkness that lives in the hearts of every human being. This is how C.S. Lewis puts it in um, Mere Christianity. This is powerful stuff. Every time you make a choice, you are turning the central part of you, the part of you that chooses into something a little different than it was before. And taking your life as a whole, all the innumerable choices, all your life long, you are slowly turning this central thing into a heavenly creature or a hellish creature either into a creature that is in harmony with God and with other creatures and with itself, or else into one that is in a state of war and hatred with God and with its fellow creatures and with itself. To be one kind of creature is heaven, that is, it is joy and peace and knowledge and power. To be the other means madness, horror, idiocy, rage, impotence, and internal loneliness. Each of us, at each moment, is progressing to the one state or the other. Now, he wrote a number of years ago, some of that language isn't language that we would use today, but the point is well made. 
There is an invitation to a journey, to the way, to be apprenticed by Jesus, to be formed in Christ, a journey that moves us from brokenness to wholeness, from being sick to being healthy, from being addicted or bound to being free, from our false self to our true self, from darkness to light, from being wounded to being healed. I'm going to push this a little bit further in a few minutes, but I want us to pause just there. As I've offered this Scripture a different way of understanding the Scripture, an invitation to a journey to be apprenticed by Jesus, a lifelong apprenticeship that leads to life as we are rescued from the disease of sin. So I just want us to pause, and we're going to get a bit of conversation going, a bit of dialogue here. I want to do this in a particular way this morning. We're going to use, you will need your phones. If you're here, there will be maybe a chance in a few minutes just for a couple of people to um, say something from the microphone as well. And could we have the the slide where it's got menti.com? So the questions are, where is there clarity, insight for you? Or what's disturbing or challenging? And I'd like you to go to menti.com or you can scan the QR code. And then you'll need to put in the number if you go to menti.com, 3794-9081. It's on your screens just now. Or if you're able to scan the QR code, if you're at the back, you could just turn around and use that one there. I don't know whether that's too far away to work. But menti.com. And just leave a comment there in response to these questions. Where is there clarity or insight, something that you go, ah, That's helpful, or that just gives me some insight. What's disturbing or challenging? So just suggest that you leave a a sentence, no more. If you write an essay, we might struggle to read it. And I'm just going to leave a couple of minutes. If you're on Zoom, please do participate in this. Go to menti.com, and then you need to put in 3794. 9081. And you should be able to leave a comment. See some comments. If you want to see some comments, they will appear on the screen. They're a little bit small. Or you can go to www.cce.community forward slash chat. If you go to cce.community forward slash chat, you will find all the comments there. Let's just take a moment to see what people have written. Every choice, gulp. (laughs) 
indeed. So just, if you can go to cce.community forward slash chat, you can just read them there. What I'd like to do just now is open up the mic just for anybody who wants to share something that's either come to you through what I've said that you haven't written, or as you just read the responses, what's striking you as you read some of these responses here? Maybe start with Joy. I did ask Joy about this. Is, oh, there we go. I really uh, in, appreciate this comment in the middle, which is um, disturbing, is that the will to follow Jesus' advice is not enough to make it actually happen. It requires prayer and God changing us. Yes. I think that's fabulous. It's a great comment here. I love the broad way isn't necessarily deliberate sin, but simply following the path of least resistance. There's a lot that's striking me about, this is about our choices, every choice we make. Lots of people making comments about that. Microphones here, anyone else? Just come and share something. Sorry. Oh, cc.community forward slash chat. And then you do need to keep refreshing the page. Uh, Mine just keeps. So Joy's you saying you need to refresh the page. Mine just seems to keep appearing. Yours is more whizzy than mine. Anybody else got anything to share? Love to hear some other voices. Another great comment here. If I'm just picking out one or two comments, it's not because the others aren't great. But I love this one. It's the small choices every day. They have a huge cumulative effect, like a small rudder will change the course of a huge ship. I, I think that's really helpful. It doesn't have to be big. I could. I really felt the Lord speak to me this summer, saying, "It's small steps will make a big difference. Small things make a big difference." Okay, I'm not hearing anybody else desperate to speak. Uh, that will stay there on the on that website forward slash chat for the next 24 hours or so. I just want to push this a little bit further just to finish with. Robert Mulholland, in his book, talks about levels of sin. It's that S word again. Or you could say brokenness. Things that bring destruction to our lives. He is basing this of, of an ancient map of a journey of faith that was formed hundreds and hundreds of years ago, just after the early church that we read about in Acts. And so, some, again, some of the language is maybe a little bit archaic here, but I think the concept is really helpful. So, the the first level of sin, the first thing that we become aware of that is destructive in our lives, that's like a disease, is what is called gross sins. Not gross as in there, but gross as in external obvious. 
These are the things that are absolutely incompatible with following Jesus, and they're incompatible, pretty much most people would agree, they're incompatible with being human, or at least being a nice human. Sexual immorality, hatred, discord, fits of rage, drunkenness. They're external, obvious sins. And when we first become a Christian, when we first start this journey on the way, these are the things that we mostly become really uh, aware of. Many of us maybe have already realized that they're not particularly nice human qualities. But we certainly, if we are on the way, we realize these are not cool things to be doing. And then the second level, he, he talks about, or, that, or the ancient schema would say, are conscious sins. Things that we become aware of that aren't compatible with following Jesus, but maybe wider society doesn't have so much of an issue with. Or perhaps it's even things that aren't necessarily wrong per se, but they are not helpful for my discipleship. So it could be about what we watch on TV or YouTube. What I find helpful might be different or unhelpful might be different from what you find unhelpful. I'm going to go through this with one particular example to explain it in a minute. Unconscious sins is the third level. It's, this is when we have moved internal rather than external. It's about our motivations, attitudes, patterns of thinking. It's what's happening deep inside us that probably nobody else sees. But even when we start dealing with these unconscious sins, these internal things, we haven't reached the bottom. The bottom of what is what Mulholland and the ancients called trust structures. It's what, if you read the scriptures, you might call idolatry, or in the Ignatian tradition, they would say disordered attachments. Attachments that we have, trust that we place in other things apart from God. That is the very root of the disease that exists within our hearts. Mulholland says, These are the deep-seated attitudes and inner orientations of our being, out of which our behavior patterns flow. Those deep inner postures of our being that do not rely on God, but on our, but on self. Do not rely on God, but on self for our well-being. Let me illustrate these four things with anger. So at the top, the gross sin might be fits of rage, violent anger, fighting or abuse. It's playground stuff when you're growing up, particularly for boys. But then as we grow older, that violence or abuse just manifests its way, unfortunately, in the home too often. Naomi talked about this a few weeks, months ago. Violent abuse in the home, violence, fits of rage. We'd all recognize that this is deeply, deeply destructive behavior, external anger, not talking about a righteous, perhaps good anger at the injustices in the world here. We're talking about an unhealthy, destructive anger. That's at the top, the gross sins. As we move down, conscious sins might be angry words. It's the way we speak about other people. Oh, they're such an idiot, or worse. It's conscious. Many people in our society wouldn't see that there's a problem with saying, oh, they're such an idiot. We do it all the time about our politicians that we don't agree with. 
those are conscious sins. Then we move down to unconscious sins. As we journey with Jesus, we realize that actually there's a deep-seated anger in our hearts. We maybe become aware of anger towards our parents or other significant others as we were growing up, others who've hurt us. And here's the killer. We realize that we're angry with God because he hasn't come through for us we're right into internal unconscious sins. And then as we journey with Jesus even more, we finally realize that actually the root of all of this is my lack of trust in God. That we've been invested in certain outcomes or activities that haven't worked out in the way that we had hoped and it begins to shine a light on our trust structures that we've put in place to make life work for us. Oof. And we begin to realize these are the root issues, the root destructiveness or disease that Jesus wants us to walk along a different path to life. Now, I want to suggest that in the church, we have predominantly majored on number one and two. Not this church, but the church in general. External, gross, or conscious sins we haven't described this journey of a narrow path well. We haven't helped Christians walk along this path towards life well. And so what tends to happen is many people get stuck in their journey of faith. We've not mapped it out well, so people often hit a wall where God doesn't come through for them in the way that they hope the way they've been taught or told would happen. And we don't know how to journey into the internal and into the trust structures level, which is where profound transformation begins to happen because we're changed from the inside out. We haven't described the long life apprenticeship to Jesus that's needed to dive down into our inner worlds and the trust structures at level three and four that will help us step into life, help us journey throughout life upon the narrow path that brings life. So I want to invite you to a journey this morning. Maybe you're here, maybe you're watching, and you haven't yet started following Jesus. This morning, please, jump in. If you're inspired, if you're challenged, if this has been in any way helpful and you would like to jump in, aware of the longing and the ache and the desires and the hurt and the pain in your own soul, maybe you're far from God. This morning, you can come closer. But I want to say clearly, that's the first step on a lifelong journey. A lifelong journey of being apprenticed to Jesus. Maybe you're here in earlier stages of faith. Maybe you're really aware that you are wrestling with those first two levels, gross or conscious sins, and that is entirely appropriate at the early stages of a journey of faith. That's absolutely where you should be. In fact, we're probably all at that place in certain areas of our lives. 
There are some things where I feel I'm diving right down into level three and four. And there are other areas where I'm just becoming conscious and aware of things that maybe I need to deeply and profoundly change at level one or two. But if you're starting your journey of faith, you're in those early stages, please don't rush down to level four thinking that's the place to go. I don't think it is. Just keep on walking with Jesus. But if you're here and you recognize that maybe you've got a bit stuck in your journey of faith, I want to invite you to progress deeper through some of these levels. If you feel you've hit a wall, that you're not growing, that we can continue to walk along the narrow path that leads to life. Now, if this sounds all a little bit heavy, I want us to end with a little bit of good news. The good news is you can't do it. That's the good news. I love what Mott Holland says. It's the process of being formed. It's a work of the Spirit in our lives. Jesus is the only one that can do that for us. That's the good news. You can't do it. I can't do it. But here's what happens. The winds come and blow. The rains happen. Life happens. And we have choices at that point that we can make at every moment to cooperate with the work of the Spirit of forming Christ in us. All we can do is take the next step. Put one thing into practice. That's all we can do. That's what we're invited to do in the second parable. Put into practice what you hear Jesus saying. One thing, the next thing, that's it. And we trust the work of the Spirit to form Christ in us over many years of faithful following and being apprenticed by Jesus. He will form Christ in us. All we have to do, the next thing, one thing, put it into practice. And so that leads me to our practice. The end of each of these, I've offered a practice. The first time the practice was silence. Just regularly, daily, sit in silence for a few minutes. If you sit in silence, it will change your life, eventually, slowly. That was practice one. Practice two was how do we engage with a community that withdraws to be with Jesus? This fully alive has to flow out of our being with Jesus and being with one another with Jesus. It's the only way we can do it. I can't do it on my own. I can do it with you, and I can do it as I'm with Jesus. The third practice coming out of today, what's the one thing that Jesus has been speaking to you about that you've not done anything about? Put it into practice. If there's something that you know where God has been tugging at your heart, something you've been inspired about, something that's moved you or convicted you, and you're yet to do something about it, go and do it. Whatever it is. Because that's the next step on the path to life. Shall we pray? We're just going to sing one final song and then do a dedication. So let's pray. Father, I thank you for this journey of life that you lead us on. Thank you that you don't leave us alone, that you've given us your spirit.
thank you that we can't do this, but we can take the next step to cooperate with the work of your spirit in our hearts and in our lives. And I pray for each of us here in all kinds of different places, all kinds of different stages of our faith and our journey of life, aware of all kinds of different winds and rains that might be blowing around in our lives, that in the midst of life, Jesus, you walk with us and you journey with us and you invite us to walk along this narrow path that brings life and life in all its fullness. And I pray that in, this, in these moments just now that you would speak to each of us about the one thing that we could do coming out of today. pray for those that feel stuck, that have reached that kind of wall where they're not seeming, finding ways of growing and continuing, just got a bit stuck. Father, I pray, help us just to take the next step of following you.